How's it going? Welcome again to Natural Freedom League. I am John White Dogan. We are at naturalfreedomleague.com. Here once again, as always, with my producer and co-host, Chill Will Keller. What's up, brothers and sisters? How's it going? Yeah. How you doing, Will? Another night. Ready, yeah. excited, and, and looking forward to this convo. Yeah, this is a good one. We've got Cal Washington, who is the creator of the Notice of Liability, which you'll learn more about as the interview goes on. And also, I guess you'd be the founder of Empower Movement, right? Uh, Co-founder, yeah. Co-founder of Empower yeah. Movement. Welcome, Cal. Welcome. I'm, I'm glad to be here and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Yeah. Where are you located? I'm in Vancouver, Canada, so West Coast. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Cool. All right. We're going to jump right in. Um, you know, I know a lot about your story, but um, give our audience kind of just a general um, understanding of what you were going through that led up to um, creating the Notice of Liability. Uh, well, it, it was just a normal guy and, and ended up in a divorce, which, which put me headlong into court, which then turned into a, um, like a child custody battle and then, and then a, um, child maintenance thing. And, uh, that's where things got, uh, noticeably aggressive and, um, I couldn't kind of figure out why, because I wasn't one of these uh, so-called deadbeat dads, and that was the paint. That was the picture. That that's the paintbrush they paint on anybody that can't make their payments, um, regardless of why they can't make their payments. So, um, I had five kids. I was off of their their charts, so none of their math worked. It's just it's straight up math, and and math is math, and you you know, you can't get more out of, out of something than is there. Like it, it just doesn't work. So because I had five kids, um, you know, everything got exacerbated and it kind of, it kind of shone a light on the, on the, the pro the systemic problem, uh, there. And I'm just the type of guy that I, you know, I wasn't going to back down. I, you know, I, I would, I would hold my ground. I'm, I'm a nice guy, but I, you know, there's a part of me that just like, you no, know, and so um, that's what, what ended up happening is I was just like, no, you can't make me do this. And, you know, you can't force me to do anything. And uh, so that was the clash, of course. And I had no knowledge. I would just had knowledge of what I thought court was. And then when I got in there, I, I came to the thing where I thought what court should be. <laughs> and so, you know, I tried that and then, um, then I found out what court was, that's when the game changed. So it was more like I went through the stage of what I thought it was, what I think it should be and what it is. And then once I knew what it was, I knew what, you know, then, then you, you're playing in the proper game and the proper venue and all that. So um, regardless of whether you agree with it, once you know what something is, then you can deal with it in, a, in, um, in reality, not in, a, in ignorance or in, um, uh, you know, your own fantasy, your own beliefs about something. And um, so I, I found out it was very commercial, the whole thing. That led to finding out the whole country is commercial and everything is commercial. And all these uh, governments, um, all these entities were just for-profit businesses. And again, it's hard for some people to believe that because we've been taught something else. But again, as soon as I went, okay, that's what they are and started dealing with them as such, that's when the, the, you know, the tide started to turn for me. So then I knew I was onto something and, and one thing led to another, just learned as much as I could. I had a lot of, you know, ups and downs in there. You know, I was arrested lots of times and um, I had to appear in court. I had a lot of, you know, judges yelling at me and all that kind of stuff. Arrests, um, name calling, pepper spray, you know, like I, I went through it. So um, long story short, once I sort of got, 
you know, a handle on commerce because we tried the first thing and the, the judge ran out of the room, but we didn't really know what we were doing. We were just like, okay, let's try this piece of paper, you know, number 78 of all the other pieces of paper we tried. And um, it was kind of like that, right? Look, let's see what this does. And when a judge ran out of the room, we went, okay, well, that's way different than anything we've seen. And so what, what is that that caused that? Because at first we didn't even know what caused it. It was like, what happened here? I think he ran out because of that piece of paper we put in there. No. Yeah, I think he did. So why? Learn, learn, learn. And then, um, you know, start to get some mastery on the thing. And then it came to a point where they, uh, they were out of my life. So you talked about a lot how at a certain point you started like driving with no license. Was this after you kind of went through the divorce and you saw what the system was? Did you start purposely kind of confronting the system in yeah. a way? Yes. Challenging it? Yes. Because as I went down more rabbit holes, because once you start to read about the court, you start reading acts and then you okay, well, who passed these acts? And then what's this parliament? And, you know, like, uh, not, not what I what I was told or what I thought it was, or even what I thought it should be. What is it? And, um, you, you know, you start to come to some conclusions and then you go, okay, I'm not putting up with this. This is Walmart can't tell me that I have to shop with them. And if I don't, then I get arrested. Like, no, not happening. And once you come to that sort of point of view, you, you know, and if you're, if you hold that, there's not much they can do because Walmart can't tell you that, that you have to shop at their store. And if you didn't show up in two weeks, then there's a warrant for your arrest. Yeah. So yeah. what, what do you mean by when you say reading the acts, like you're reading the, the different laws? Yeah, because when I, uh, when I first got in there, I, I thought, like everybody else, these are laws and there's, you know, I, there's got to be some remedy in here and I, I got to learn this stuff. So I read the acts. I read the Family Maintenance Act, you know, probably 10 times. By the time I got to the Motor Vehicle Act, I probably read that one 20 times. I knew it better than all the cops and, um, and most of the judges. But I still didn't get, it didn't get me anything. Like I could find all the arguments. I could, you know, bring other acts into it, show everything. And you could see the look on their face. Their body language is like, Bleh. but rule against you mm -hmm. over and over and over. So you go, what, what, what is this? It's not law. It's not the law courts that I was, you know, watching Perry Mason or whatever it was. However, I figured out what, you know, the court was, there's that balance thing you always see. And so you have this idea that it's about right and wrong in some way. And, you know, and they, they might make mistakes, but it's based on some kind of truth and justice. Well, it's not. And um, the more you bang your head against that wall, it, it just doesn't go away. So I just kept going and, you know, started to figure out what it was. And once I, once I knew it was a, uh, a for-profit corporation, no different than Walmart or McDonald's. Well, now I've got a different perspective on it. And people may think, you know, that just sounds ludicrous. But the fact is, as soon as I started treating them like that, like you can't, you, you, as a corporation, you, you don't get to tell me what to do, how I can contract with you, force me to, to do business with you. You can't do that. Oh, and that's when the judges started to go, okay, you know, and, and the judge is the, your frontline guy, right? So they usually have the most knowledge in the, in the room, not always, but mostly. And, um, and they're the frontline guy taking the hit. They're also, you know, they're, they've got that authority in there, but when you start to get them to backpedal, they realize, hey, it's my signature on that piece of paper. I'm not taking the hit for all these guys that nobody sees. <laughs> It's amazing um, with perception, right? A lot of people don't even question their own perception and how the lens in which they view the world. A lot of people think certain things are one way until they actually start looking into it for themselves and start doing their own research and peeling back those, those layers of the onion and discover that it was something completely different. So it's, you almost yeah. discovered the scam and they mm -hmm. knew that. 
But there's some people who still hold to a, a point of view and uh, what I call a, a cognitive bias. And we all have it, but you have to kind of let that go a little bit if you want to get to the truth, because if you color everything with your bias and it's incorrect or, or incomplete, you're not going to get to the truth because you're always going to go, no, that doesn't sure. fit with my what's going on in my head here. So I have to discard that or and um, that's the I've seen that with a lot of, you know, very smart people as well. They rigidly hold that there is that the law is uh, this is all all true and everything. So they, they, they just won't look at anything else. Yeah. Tunnel vision. It's got to be rooted in logic and reason. So you got sometimes yeah. you got to set those emotions aside and yet and we all, we all battle it. Yeah. You know, it's, you can, you can build up and become more disciplined, but yeah, no, you're right for sure. Yeah. So you have to have an open mind about everything. And, um, you know, the Bible is one that most people shun. It's a book that most people shun and they don't even know why, because when you ask them, you know, where, you know, where did you get your opinion from? If you haven't read it, they're, they're like, uh, well, I don't even know. Yeah. But sure. I hate the book. Uh, but why? <laughs> um, hmm. You see, it's like that. So we have these little programs running in the back of our head and we don't even, we're unaware that they are. So you have to really strive to, you know, you want to hold your bias if it's, if it's, if it's working, but the minute it doesn't, don't just assume whatever you're seeing is wrong. You, your bias might be wrong. So you gotta, you know, you gotta be open-minded to be able to figure out which is, which is correct. Yeah. So True. the story that you tell about the judge running out, was that sort of a precursor to the notice of liability? What was, what had you filed at that, at that time? That was the first time we put a, um, a commercial instrument in on a case and the case had already been running for, cause it was the driving one. It had been running well over a year because, you know, I kept doing, not showing up and abating it. And, you know, they kept arresting me and then just this is a revolving door of, of stupidity. Right. So, um, but I had never seen a judge run out of a room before and, and very few people do. So, um, that's when we kind of went, okay, because there's gotta be something here. Otherwise, why is that guy running? Right. So it was, it was the beginning of, it was the beginning of the end It's like, that was the point when the tide started to turn. I wouldn't say, you know, everything changed at that instant, but that's when it started to go the other direction so that was, tell us, that was a turning point tell us a little bit about the um because i you know i've been waiting I, I hope you guys actually do do a video of like your whole story because when you tell it it's like I, i'm trying to put together like is this the same case that he's dealing with or is these different cases but um tell us the story about the promissory note on your on your jail time well, on that, actually that same case, they, it dropped for about a year. They didn't do anything. I, I, I abated it. I used a common law abatement. They didn't answer. And so I said, well, I'm not coming. You, you know, this is a lawful uh, process. And it seemed to work for about a year, maybe a year and a half. And then they arrested me at work. And um, they brought a rookie cop in. Actually, the last few times I was arrested, it was a rookie. Like, I mean, brand new. You need to open the door. You need to put the gun in the in the trunk. Like, <laughs> it was like, I'm telling you, it was like, <laughs> this guy has, this is the first time he's put his shoes on. Like, seriously. And twice I had those guys like that. They are, this is their first day. They probably they, sent they probably sent him on purpose because yes, they, yes, he was they dealing did. with you. <laughs> yes. And there was always a sergeant there who did wasn't the arresting officer. It was the it was the new guy, right? They they would bring him out and then get him to go through the steps. Okay, now, okay, you have to get him to answer, like you have to open the door. Okay, now close it. Like wow. So they came with two guys came and one of them was that guy and the other guy was a, a sergeant or a lieutenant or something and um they took me in 
they took me into their detachment and then they took me straight to the court, which was really unusual. And it was out of, it was out of their jurisdiction, actually. Uh, it was out of their city, like, a, you know, our city has suburbs. And so they were, they were a, a police force from a, a suburb. It took me into the Vancouver courthouse and then handed me to the, um, to the sheriffs there. And then I hadn't spoken to them. As soon as he said I was under arrest, I said, okay, well, from now on, I'm going to be remaining silent, just so you know, okay? Like, no offense, but that's, these are my last words. So I wouldn't speak to them. And I wouldn't give, I wouldn't give any eye contact. I just looked out the window the whole time and they were asking me all these questions and just pretended like I didn't hear them. So as soon as they handed me to the, took the cuffs, their cuffs off me and the sheriffs put their cuffs on me, that was the switching of the of the merchandise. Then I then I spoke to the other cops and said, "Oh yeah, by the way, give me your business card." And, and the sergeant went, "Oh," and he stuck it in my shirt. I couldn't take it because my hands were behind my back, but he stuck it in my shirt. And um, uh, yeah, so I went in there. They held me without bail. They wouldn't give me a bail hearing because I'd already not shown up. Like dozens of times we were in this, like I said, we were in this revolving door of, you know, they picked me up and then, no, I'm not participating. And uh, so they held me without bail. And it was a Friday on a, on a July, the, I remember it was a July the 4th, because we were gonna do a July the 4th um, celebration here and I never went and nobody, you know, none of my family knew where I was or anything. So they helped me out, it was a long weekend and, um, they held me without bail. So, you know, I couldn't get out. And um, so my friends put in a promissory note because we all, you know, by this time we were um, way further down the road than when that first, like it was probably at least a year and a half. And we'd learned a lot in that time. So they did a, a promissory note to pay the corporation that's trying to make profit off of my arrest and my all my charges and all that stuff is all just money making. So here's a big pile of money and uh, let our guy go, you know, have at her. And so they took it, they took it out of the file, they put it in the file and it was gone the next time they checked. So they accepted it, but they didn't let me go. They held me on, you know, held me in, uh, held me for six, I was in for 60 days. And um, because they couldn't get jurisdiction and on and on and on and on. Uh, it was, it was a, uh, it was a Laurel and Hardy show really. And um, so at the, at the very end, she gave me, um, she tried to give me a five year driving prohibition and uh, I think it was $1,285 fine and one day in jail and 59 days credit. So that was my sentence. And so I, I knew the five-year driving prohibition would just keep me in this revolving door of breaking my conditions contract. So I, I, uh, I told her to drop that and she did. And um, the prosecutor was just shocked, but like I knew she, this was a corporation and I can, I can negotiate with her. Right? I said, no, that's going to cause me harm. And she goes, okay, well, we'll, we'll just drop that. And so all I had was the one day in jail and a $1,200 fine after 60 days. And um, so I said, well, the 59 days credit. Now I had seen credit before on somebody else's case and we didn't, we didn't know what that was. Right. He, he ended up with 14 days credit. And we're kind of like, well, how do you, why do you get what, what's, jail time credit. I mean, you can rob a 7-Eleven and for free, what, like, you know, what is that? And uh, so, we, you know, I had seen it before and we pondered it and we, you know, tried to figure out what that meant. And, and you know, uh, and then when I was in the 60 days, I learned a bunch of things in there that when you're in remand, your time is doubled by the time you get a sentence. So the longer you stay in uh, remand, you're actually doing double time off of your sentence. So, and then I also heard is if you, um, like if you, if they're holding you, 
and then they find out that you, like you were innocent or whatever, then they'll, they would pay you, I think it was $360 a day or something like that. So I had all these things in my head and I didn't know whether they were actually true or not, but I wanted to talk about the credit now. So now I'm thinking, okay, I could at least get something out of this. Right. And uh, so she was, she obliged me. She said, oh yeah. Okay. I'll just talk about the credit. Like, what do you want to do with that? And, um, and um, I basically said that the, there was a note put in for my incarceration and she, you know, hummed and hawed about that. And then I, um, once she agreed that the note was there and it was let, you know, given to the clerk of the court, I said that the promissory note has to equal the, the 59 days credit because that's the transaction. And um, it ha like the, it has to balance. That's what it was for is to get me out. And now you've just given me um, my time back on a piece of paper. Well, that piece of paper has to equal this other piece of paper. And so, because it, it's a, uh, as soon as there's a credit, that's a, that's a commercial instrument, really. So, they have to balance. And so she, so she agreed with that, and then asked how much it was, and it was three hundred million U.S. And then she, you know, guffawed, and and there was a bunch of um, noise from the gallery because there was a lot of people, you know, a lot of lawyers and ex-prosecutors that had been on the case all kept coming to my case and police office like it was a it was a bit of a like I said Laurel and Hardy show and so there was a lot of noise from back there and um then I said I I also didn't want them just to, to sign it and give it back to me so I said I want that in in uh in cash or gold as well that, that was the last thing I said Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what led, that's what was the beginning of that next journey. So now I was done with that because I never, ever, ever appeared in court again on anything after that day. <laughs> They're like, we don't want to <laughs> leave this guy alone. <laughs> and so if I did get, a, you know, accosted, on uh, like SkyTrain, I had a beef with them as well. Um, and they, you know, they radio, once they find my name, however they find it, uh, you know, there's somebody talking in their ear, right? And and I can see the look on their face. They're like, and then they look at me and like, oh uh, yeah, we, we're just, um, this is over. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're in no part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I don't look like that. And I don't act like that. I don't, I don't have all the, I don't do, use all the lingo that, that a normal um, free man of the land, Patriot, whatever, whatever we're called these days, I don't do any of that stuff. I just act like, you know, whatever. And then they, they hear it in the ear and that's when they're told, um, you know, get out of this as quickly as possible. Cause they usually everything speeds up and they just disappear after that. And I've seen that no, numerous times, so I know that's what they're being told. Like, um, just quickly finish this and and move on. Leave that guy alone. Yep, you're you're on to the uh, to the sham. So it's it's pretty much like discovering the the hidden language, right? The occult contractual um, system that they're running. Yeah, and well, figured it out, and once you can see that, then. And you can, different rules. Yeah. And, and then once you understand how it works at the, at the, like the ancient one that's tied to, you know, spiritual principles, you win every time because they're lying and you, you can't, their own game. The only reason why they win is because everybody else is in ignorance. As soon as somebody comes and knows how to play the game, well, they lose every time because they're on the lying side. So it just, it fails the whole thing. Like it just, you know, yeah. So like that the light shines on their own on their own self, and that incident led to, is that where you saw people resigning, after that, well, or was that later? well when when I got out now the thing was to collect, so we had to go through a big learning experience how to you know numerous ways of collecting and what to do with um, with that, like how to get that three hundred million we were going after it. 
And so we tried a couple of things, again, a lot of trial and error. For first couple of things they ignored. Then um, we went to a, uh, another seminar in New York and um, where some of the top uh, guys doing commerce and, and th those type of things went to, it was by invitation. And so there was about, I don't know, 60, 80 guys there for, uh, and women um, for three or four days. So we went there and came back with uh, new, new knowledge. And, um, and so we put together a document that we got from there too, as um, like, a, like templates, that kind of thing. So, but they were all American. So we, we, we studied all the templates there and we, we sort of pieced together um, a document. And it took a long time. It was months of studying every word. Like we made a pact with each other that we wouldn't um, just gloss over stuff. So we would look up words in the dictionary. It was, it's tedious because a sentence can take you you know, an hour just to get through. Okay, what does that mean? If that word means this, you know, it, it was like that. So we really wanted to understand it. And so we went through it, turned it into a Canadian document. And then I don't know where I got the idea from. Well, I'd become an American, I had gotten my American citizenship before this all came. So I had had uh, some dealings with the um, consulate. And then I was getting my daughter's, their um, citizenship sort of in, in throughout this whole thing. Well, I was on the, I was on the consulate site, the American consulate here in Vancouver. And I saw they did one of the things that, that I'm, um, that I can get as an American citizen is notary services from the consulate. So I thought, you know, we were having some struggles with notaries anyway. So I went, I'm going to go get, let's, let's go get this thing notarized at the consulate. Well, little did I know that that little decision was like massively huge. So we went in there, uh, they, they, they stamped the first round. Well, the phone calls were made because by the time we went in to do the next, uh, the next round, they're like, no, we're not signing this. Mm, these are all Canadian politicians, has nothing to do with us. And I said, well, I'm an American citizen. I can, I, I can have things notarized here. No, we're not doing it. Then I said, the contract is in US dollars and falls under US jurisdiction. He stared at me for about two seconds, said, I'll go get her. Hmm. Stamped it. Not only did they stamp it, they put a, a piece of their own piece of paper on the front of it, a big rivet through it, a brass rivet, and said, confirmation of an instrument. This document has 21 pages, blah, 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 blah. big American seal on it, bam. <laughs> Sent that in, kaboom. Huh. That's crazy. Wow. That's <laughs> fascinating, man. So, so that was yeah. a precursor to the NOL? Yeah, well, what ended up happening is also not that, you know, that story went on for another year because I still didn't get paid, but it, a lot of people were disappearing and um, went up to the feds. The top guy in the country left. And that's when we went, whoa, because this is a, like, that's the guy that left. We were not expecting that at all. Like, not at all. He was, a, he would have been insider, insider, way up the food chain, like way up. And he left on the day he got his notice of default. And so we went, okay, we're, this is serious. We're in, like, this is, we're scratching this, we're scratching at the top of this thing, you know, like we're, we're poking at the, at the you know the hidden stuff like this guy was uh like the you know the head of the um he had been the the uh head of the um bank of canada he had been the head of uh i think the imf one of the one of the international banks like this was a serious dude like he knows those you know the people we all don't want to mention so he wasn't, he doesn't have that family name, but he would have been um, in the same rooms with that, that kind of level. And um, so we, we just kept going. And um, at a certain point, just after that, after I had them all in default, 
I was guided to stop going after the money and go after the queen. And so I went, okay, I, you know, I just want to do what's right. And, and when I realized, okay, now what do I need to go after the queen? I went, I have it all. Everything that I was doing, thinking I was going after the money, I was actually going after the queen. It was the exact same documentation. I'm like, who did that? Because you, so had had you had to do each level on the way up. I had them all in default. I had all the mailings because I was doing a commercial process. So I had all the bills of lading, all the, the mail numbers, like witnesses, notary, boom, boom, boom. Everybody's in default three times. Like you cannot say that I didn't go through the steps, right? The document was that thick by the time I sent it to her because I had I had copies of everything. So it all ended up on her desk, and I had to write a uh, uh, I had to write a, like you know a cover. It wasn't a cover letter, but it was a I had to write something. So what I what I wrote was a mandamus, which is one of the prerogative writs going back um, in ancient uh, well not ancient but old English law. So it's one of the prerogative writs in the common law, which is an order from a higher court to a lower court. That's what it, that's what it is. So I did, it was 95% Bible verses. So I went online, I looked up, you know, just word searching any words that, I, that would pertain to what was all, you know, all my grievances. And I just got Bible verse after Bible verse after Bible verse. And then I translated them to 1611. So I started with Bible verses, got them into 1611, then I organized them, and then I wrote the, the document around the Bible verses. And by 1611, you mean, what do you, what do you mean by? The 1611 King James, the spellings are different. Right. So if you just get a regular um, King James, it's old words, but the spellings are um the alphabet we use now, but in 16, in the 1600s, the alphabet was different. And um, you can see it on old documents and old buildings and, and things like that. Like I don't, T, T's or J's and like certain letters are kind uh, of swapped out. Yeah, the U's, the big one was the U's and the B's. Ah, yeah. Uh, I's and J's, uh, F's, S's or F's sometimes. Um, there's a couple other anomalies, but when you read it, you, you, you see it. And, um, interesting thing that changing of the alphabet changed every verse, as far as I know, in the Bible. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. That's staggering actually. And that's the Bible that the queen swore her oath on, right? So technically, she did not swear on on uh, the more modern King James ones. That's how they like. That's how she can dodge. Like they do all this kind of technicality, trickery nonsense. So you have to be. Um, and again, you have to deal with what is, not what <laughs> should be, or all that stuff. Like I try not to judge too much. It's just that's how it is. Okay, well that's how it is. Uh, this that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to try and pretend or, you know, or agree with it or anything. Just, you know, I can see what they're doing. I get it. Yeah. But here, 1611, take a Where bite. did you, where did you get the idea to use that Bible? Was that taught to you in the commerce class? No, it wasn't. And um, it was just, you know, all the meetings of all the people that I ever had, there was one guy who was adamant about this 1611. And there's so much lore out there, what I call patriot lore. It's just like, whatever, you know, signing in black and blue and red and, you know, like all, like there's so much of that stuff. And, and we studied it all, we tried it all. And it's all like, so I just thought that was like lore. Okay, whatever. I, like, I really can't see the difference, like what, what difference does it make? And that's how I was. Then I, I just happened to be at a store and I saw one. And I went, oh, because you don't see them. Or at least I hadn't up until that point. Maybe I just wasn't aware. But I thought, well, I'll just buy this book. And I started reading it. 
And um, after a day or two, I could, it, it was really hard to read at first. And then I was able to read it like very fluently. And, um, and there was something different about it. Anybody that's read it knows what I'm talking about. I can't explain it to you, but there's something different about it. Like there's just something going on there um, with the numerology or the gematria or mm. so, like there's some, uh, there's, a, there's something else going on with that particular book. So I could feel that. So I went, okay, well, there's something about this. So the next time we did a document, because we were using Bible verses all the time, I said, well, let's just, let's use 1611. Well, you could feel the reaction from it. So we were like, okay, there's something more going on here. Everything we did was like that. It was like, let's try this. Oh, they blinked. Okay, well then let's do it again and then see if they blink again. And then, you know, it was like, it was just a lot of scientific trial and error. And that's why you, you kind of pair off the stuff that doesn't matter and you go to the stuff that's actually you know, getting, getting, uh, getting a reaction from them. So the 1611 was, then I, you know, of course, once you've, once you've come to that conclusion that there is something to this, now you got to find out why, and then you, you go down those rabbit holes, right? So, yeah. <laughs> that, that is, yeah, that is fascinating. Oh, man. So that whole thing to answer your, the question was about 15 minutes ago. Um, once I did the document to the, um, I met Josh around the time when, when we did that notary thing and, and, and the government was just, you know, they were panicking and it was in the news and everything, right? Not what, no, not my name or anything, but you could see the numbers correlated was exactly 300 million and they were panicking. And, and then we, we put a document in um, based on a Bible verse that they had to give us um, 20% more out of Levitius, the fifth part. Then all of a sudden the newspaper was saying 360 million. Like it was just like, whoa, dude, this is real. Like the, it, it, you're reading this in the news. That's and crazy. you know people are people are phoning in on these talk shows like what is this 360 million dollars you guys lost in one day oh we got to go to commercial what you know all, all that right because <laughs> they didn't want to talk about it and um but they had to i guess so josh met me around that time and then josh came i when i when i wrote to the queen when i had all that done i had um 12 witnesses come we went down to the water I live on the ocean. So we, we went to the water and I went out on um, like on a rock or something. So I was out in the water so that my voice went across the waters around the world. And I read the whole document. It was just something we had to do. And, and a lot of being showed up for that. So anyway, Josh was, was one of those people. So we had become friends over the, over the years. So, and he was, he, he moved around quite a bit. Um, so he was in Seattle years later, everything's died down and I'm just, you know, carrying on with my life pretty much. And, um, he did the smart meter, um, movie and he'd shot it, but he didn't know how to edit it. And so one of the guys that was with me on this journey, he's a, a film editor. So I said, Oh, you know, hook you up with, with, with my buddy. And, and so they hit it off. They, 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 you know, put the movie together and went out. And he got lots of awards and it had a lot of, um, it was very educational and, and woke a lot of people up. But as time went on, he, he felt, you know, every time he shows it at a theater, people walk out in total dread and like, you know, the world's ending and I'm going to die. You know, everybody's in that state. And he just thought this is, there's no solution. It just leaves the, leaves you hanging on this black, over top of this black mm -hmm. hole. So he knew about all the things that I had done. And he said, you know, is there a document you can use on this smart meter thing? And I knew a little bit about smart meters, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't an expert and um, still not that really. And um, so I looked at it and went, well, this is commercial. I can see it. I can see this is an offer and they're using tacit agreement, all the, all the stuff I already know about. So took the, doc the document on the 300 million that I had put in and caused all that, um, turmoil and took the, the bones of that and turned it into the smart meter um, thing, which is now the notice of liability. Hmm. So it's, the, it's that document that caused all that 
Um, so we know that there was you know, soundness in it. And um, so that's where that all came from. You hit a bullseye with that one, huh? Yeah. That one, that one made people run. So that's the one we're going with. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And I, I want to clarify something too. So a tacit agreement, is that them using green language to get the people to softly uh, consent? A tacit yeah. agreement? A tacit agreement is, um, if you it, put it this way, if you don't say no, and I should qualify that, if you don't say no correctly, if you get into this, then you've said yes. I got you. Yeah. So, um, you know, well, John's probably, uh, you remember Columbia Records? Uh, I mean, no, the, um, you used to be able to get records for, or tapes for a dollar. Tower like records the, or like the uh, clubs. Yeah, the record clubs. The record clubs. And and if you didn't stop them, the, the, they just kept coming. Right. That's oh, based, yeah, okay. yeah. That's based on tacit agreement. You just you've you've said yes, so we're just gonna keep sending you and then bill you, right? So Got that's ba- that's that's a commer- that's based on a commercial process. So why don't you explain the basic process of so like how Will's asking about tacit agreement? It's the idea is that the governments are corporations Mm -hmm. and that they're things that we think we have to do. We don't have to do. It's just that they've gotten us to tacitly agree to it um, by making us an offer. And we may not even be aware that they've made us the offer. Um, So why don't you explain kind of the process of the NOL um, specifically the, the, the conditional acceptance yeah, so between merchants, going back to the to the ancient uh, Lex Mercatoria or what's called Law Merchant, amongst there was there was principles and ways of doing things that weren't really written down, but but they were uh, agreed upon by the merchant class. So the like the you know the the wealthy the 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 ruling class and the merchant class. So you didn't have to be. Um, like noble, but you had to be, you were in that class of, of, uh, of wealthy people. So they had, they had these things and, and they had some um, strange um, instruments, bills of exchange that had value because you wrote it on a piece of paper. And that's, you know, I'm kind of um, saying it bluntly but really it was just a piece of paper with some writing on it. and um, nobody ever came to get it. So it, it, it had value because people believed it had value because it was written by somebody who you thought had money or appeared to have money. So it's, it's, there's a lot of sleight of hand with it, but the merchant class all agreed that this was fine. So with the birth certificates, uh, you know, after the thirties, after the, um, towards the last bankruptcy we just came out of, uh, from 29 they turned us all into merchants so you got to understand this and um therefore they can use merchant uh, procedures against us or, or or i'm saying against but um they can they can they can make you um involved with merchant merchant um traditions and and laws etc and you don't know it. That's the thing. So it's like the operating system, right? Yeah. So that that's the thing. Everybody's a merchant and they don't know it. And you have a merchant number. It's the number you put when you, um, it's your SSN number, when you pay your taxes, when you go to get a loan at a bank, when you social security. Yeah. Yeah. So when you, you'll see, you have to use that number a lot. That's your merchant number. And you, it's unique to you, and and your credit rating is based on it. All everything commercial is that's your that. So you are a merchant. So tacit agreement is usually in modern times when there's a when you have dealings with another merchant, and similar to that record club where okay, I've already sold you this, and and um, you know, so six months from now, you know, you want this every six months. I don't have to go and ask you if you know. It, it, we just because you haven't said no i'm just going to send you the next load <clears throat> so it's kind of based on that type that's the the normal type of um 
thing where there's a tacit agreement, but it goes deeper than that. If, if somebody puts an offer to you and, um, and he, he, even multiple times, but even just once, and you don't say no, then you've said yes, because you're a merchant. Mm. And I know it's, it's hard for people to get their head around this, that you can do this, but this is how it works. And I'm, like I said, this is going to be the third time I'm saying it. Don't go by what you think it is or how it should be. Go by what it is. Excellent. Now the the origin of the agreement, is that done by our parents when they pretty much uh, submit to a, uh, a birth or, you know, the certificate of birth? Is that when it start or is that a certain age when the agreement is official? It starts with your birth certificate. That's when, uh, yeah. I don't want to get too far down this thing, but that's when that trust thing is set up because we're in a, we're in a, uh, bankruptcy. It was three terms of 70 years. And that 70 years is a biblical term. Like the, the Bible and commerce are like, and, um, sure. And we just came out of that one in 1999, the last one. That's why everything's all topsy turvy. And they're trying to, everybody's trying to buy for the next, you know, millennium or what, the next set of years or however long that is. Mm -hmm. I don't have all the answers on that, but th this is over. And um, the bankruptcy ended. So, um, part of the last bankruptcy in 29, when they, they, you know, they crashed the market and, and they went into the depression by pulling the money back. Um, they, in order to, to get the money going again, they had to pledge, you know, you have to borrow the money and we, you, you have to pledge something. So they, they pledged the citizens, mm. the ta their, their ability to tax them, yeah, which is what the income tax is. And that's why it, you can't find it as a law thing. And, you know, it's, that's why everybody's like, but you have to pay taxes because you're actually collateral on the loans going back from 1929 in that bankruptcy. So, so that's where it starts. And then that trust is set up. Now the trust is supposed to um, offset things, but they don't do it. And, you know, many have tried. And that's when you become a um, juristic person or a, or a jurist, a fictional, um, there's a fictional piece that has your name. Also uh, a slave, right? I mean, that would be the, the current human condition. Uh, it's a form of slavery because someone's making a claim upon your body. Yes. That would be the definition. Yes, yeah. it is. You you are in servitude, and part of part of everything that you make for the rest of your life goes to somebody who's printing money out of nothing and lending it to your government. Yeah. That's that's the game. So, um, and then they turned you into merchants so that they can make more money off of you. So every every time you sign a piece of paper, chances are it's being monetized. And. Um, because you can just, just when you get into this, you'll just see how ridiculous it is. And again, I'm not agreeing with it. I just found it, know how yeah. it works. And so, yeah, pieces of paper can turn into money just like that because they have ink on them. And um... <laughs> so the notice of liability in a way then is a way of sort of declaring that you're, you're not, participating in that or it's participating mm -hmm. in it in a way that is kind of playing their game yes you're, you're more embracing the fact that i am a merchant so let's learn the language let's learn how to say no to the offer or yes with conditions so now you can play the see this is the thing about it, it, the, the system was set up so that you couldn't take advantage of others it would double back on you it was like a shotgun clause so the system would self-correct if everybody knew how it worked mm. so the merchants long ago knew how this worked you would never try and take a, advantage of another merchant because it would double down on you and um so what i'm what, I, what you know the premise of what we're doing 
it comes really from Revelation 18, verse 6, and it says, take the cup that they've been giving you, fill it double, hand it back. So that's, that's it's, it's a biblical thing we're following. And so it's, it's not like I'm trying to get revenge or, you know, like, or anything, anything like that. It's more like that's the instruction. So we take what they've offered and say, yes, I will accept it. Because you have to accept things. You can't just deny things that, that go, you go into what's called dishonor. So you conditionally accept, just like when you're buying a house or whatever, you, you buy it with conditions that I can get the mortgaging or I sell my house or whatever it is, right? Or uh, inspection of the house, the, all the conditions. So the condition is prove that meter or whatever it is, is safe in an affidavit form. If you cannot prove it, and then you still push this on me, I'm going to charge you X amount of dollars per day. Do we have a deal? Right. And so you created the document for the people that were wanting to get the smart meter off their homes. You went with uh, Josh Del Sol. The name of that video is Take Back Your Power. That that Take that, Back Your Power. Yeah. Yeah. And that's you can find that on YouTube. And um, so from there. How did Empower, the Empower movement um, come to be? Well, he asked me to write a document, so I did. I took the, the, that big document and, and chopped it up and, and used you know, the, the parts that were the, the, the bones of it. And then he asked me to come to Seattle. He was living in Seattle at the time, which is only about two and a half hours from where I am, to come and speak to a group that wanted to do it. And so I said, no, I'm not, you know, it's not my thing. And um, he convinced me, just kept, you know, he kept at it and I went. So I went down there and I, I spoke to, um, I don't know, it was about 20 or 30 people there. And um, they're, I'm looking at them and they're, you know, the light bulbs are going off as I'm explaining some of this stuff, like the jurisdictional map thing and, uh, and I kind of went through the document, just you know, briefly how how it works. They'd all seen it, and so, um, but the, it, like, they, like I could just see them. They're all like, oh, I get it, you know. And I'm like, whoa, I've never seen this before. So that was different. And then, within about a month of that one, somebody in Detroit got a hold of it, and she's a go getter and. She flew us out there and, and, and rented a theater and everything. And so we showed the um, Take Back Your Power film. And then I, then I went through the document. Well, again, people were, were turned on and let's do this, like starting tomorrow. So all of a sudden we had two groups, one in Seattle, one in Detroit doing it. Then I happened to be working in my province, you know, four hours north of here at a winery and, um, there was a group meeting about the smart meters and asked, you know, can you, Josh knew the lady there and said, you know, Cal, can you speak? I'm like, I'm up here working, you know, I'm living in a motel and, you know, last thing I want to do is go to a meeting after I've been working all day, you know, like I don't have clothes, you know, you know I'm not prepared for this. So anyway, I went and there was about probably over a hundred there. It was, it was a pretty big meeting. And again, poof, they all just kind of woke up and um, that's kind of how it happened. One thing leads to the next. Now we have this thing, we got three, what we ended up calling seed groups. And so we helped them through the process and then more people want to do, okay, now we got to automate this thing. Then we went on a, uh, uh, Josh and I went on a um, interview with Dr. Mercola and he's got a fairly large following. Well, we were just swamped. So now we we realize, okay, there's a lot of people that are want to do this, and we, you know, we don't we just don't have the infrastructure and the wherewithal to do it. And so we've been in this phase of trying to build a um, platform that can handle that kind of volume and at that kind of rate, because we we've already seen it. We've seen it happen. Like the wave comes in, and all of a sudden you you know you have a couple thousand people. Um, you know, emailing you frantically. And um, so 
that's sort of what how it happened. And then so as we're building that, we ended up in uh, Canada, US, then Australia came on, um, New Zealand and South Africa, and now all of Western Europe in the past year or so. Mm. And we didn't solicit it. They just, whoosh, a group would pop up. We're doing it over here now too. So well, now we got to help them. And um, it's it's been amazing to watch this because I'm not doing it. Uh, like I'm not not doing it. Uh, it's happening. Mm-hmm. I'm just kind of hanging on. <laughs> <laughs> you know that I mean th- that's the you know the the spiritual realm when you when you align yourself with truth and uh, what's right in morality, you step onto a certain path that can guide you and also, you know, just clear, clear the way um, for the journey. So things just line up on their own. It's, um, it's the energy just builds the momentum and things happen. So it's powerful. And of course, the opposite case, you know, you're going to have obstacles. But um, yeah, yeah. And that's what's that's what's happened. That's how it kind of came about. It wasn't uh it wasn't thought out or anything like that. It more just ha- organically happened. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So it's awesome. I, I know you guys have had, you know, dates that you wanted to launch it and you just kind of been pushed back. Um, how are things going right now? It's going, it's always been going like there's, um, I, I still think that there is a timing to what us coming out and, um, it's starting to become more clear with all the the craziness that's going down on down in down in uh, in the U.S. and um, I think we had to wait till that. That's all. I, I don't know. I don't really know, but I'm. Uh, it's starting to look that way. So we sh- we couldn't have launched before all this was um, things are where they're supposed to be. Yeah. So um, getting a little deeper into this philosophy of um, the queen's oath and what the Bible is. I, I, I'd like to kind of just know what your perception is on the Bible, why the queen's oath is so significant and um, just, yeah, just your perspective on, um, you know, why it is that these, uh, these quotes from the Bible work. I mean, is the, is the merchant system based on the Bible or um, what's the significance of the Bible in this whole story? Well, there are those that, that's, that feel and even teach that the King James Bible is a commercial document. And it, it, I would say there is some truth to that. I don't know uh, if it was intentional, but there's definitely a correlation between commerce, like the, the pure commerce and the, and the biblical principles, like they are a mirror image of each other. And um, so one's copying the other. And I think the Bible is the, is the, the original and the, and the commerce is a uh, mirror image of, of those principles. So, like even the word debt and sin in the original language are the same word. So it's the same thing. Um, you got to have somebody, you got to have a redeemer. You got to have, um, you know, pay for your sins, uh, pay for your debts um all the all this it's it's just staggering what how much it is so the bible even the bible itself once you've read it um god calls it a covenant so there was the the first covenant and the second covenant after 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 uh, yeshua and um and covenant is a contract And, and God always, inside that thing, he says, I always hold my end of the contract. The other side never does, but he always honors his side. Like he will, he just, he, it's, it's written in there quite a bit. So that said, the queen, in my opinion, now this is my opinion. This is sort of like the, you know, all the pieces that I can see, but I'm still, you know, it's not, um, it appears that she is a um, a, a uh, demarcation point between the spirit realm and the physical realm, and or the um, the beings that are were half bred with those uh, the, the spiritual beings or whatever they are 
back at the time of Noah. And she's holding that covenant. And you'll see this in, inside the Bible too, as well, where um, the, the people of God are given over to like a, a so-called enemy for a period of time um, because they're just not following, following God properly. And it's usually, and, it, and the 70 years come up, comes up in that scenario <laughs> numerous times too. So uh, I, I really think that she has, um, she has uh, possesses, because that's the word in her oath, she's given possessions and they name a few of them, but then it says there are other possessions. And I think that is um, almost worldwide, if not worldwide. But she has to uphold this contract. That's but yet, but yet, the like, is she is she upholding it or is she not? Technically, is she, she is. But they're like they've manipulated it. Yes. They're trick. They're tricking us. Yes. So so it's like you know that's where that's where I get confused because I'm like. If, if the Bible is like a contract, you know, and there's stuff in there, you know, because I do believe there's truths in there. I believe that those then get manipulated and, you know, there has to be truth in, in something for, in, in order for it to hook people. But then it gets kind of manipulated against us, you know, it's um, so, yeah, I guess deciphering what, you know, is, is she maintaining some type of moral um moral level uh, so that the rest of us can run amok and sin you know no. and be enslaved or no it's no it's more like she she can be our slave master for a period of time as long as she holds up uh, uh, defends this this book yeah so she one of her titles is feedy defensor which is defender of the faith so it's describe what the faith is and you can look up because it even says it has to be the anglican something 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 it's in, it's in the old. So I actually went and looked and said, okay, what is that? What is that doctrine exactly? And, and so, you know, um, that's just what I do. And um, so you can, you can see what it is. Like just read it and then go, okay, what is that? Go search that. Okay. What does that mean? What is this? What is that? And you'll see what it is. So she has to uphold that um, and defend it. That, so that is the contract. So if somebody comes to you with this, Thing in their hand and they have a claim you got to honor it well guess what they did switch all the letters <laughs> nobody, nobody came right wow oh somebody came but they came the wrong way you can't do it that way you got to go to your brother in private first then you go like well sorry can't hear you it's like that so you have to you have to understand how it works again not what you think it is, not what it should be, what it is. And, and um, then once you understand that, whether you agree with it or not, and you do that, then you get different results. That's all. It's really what it comes down to. It's fascinating. Yeah, when you said uh, the phrase that's in the Bible that God always upholds his end of the bargain, I almost see that as natural law meaning the the laws inherent in nature that are immutable and you know non-man made and binding to us all it's the you know it's the the energetic laws that govern our consequences as, as humans yeah and um those are those are um exemplified in the bible and and yeshua broke it down to two like he simplified it to um love the love your lord your god with all your heart all your mind and all your soul and love your neighbor as yourself so it's a one it's it's and that doesn't mean love your neighbor as if it's yourself it's as yourself yeah for sure like direct like that is you don't steal don't cause harm because you're stealing from yourself <laughs> exactly right. yeah so yeah. Once you understand, like if everybody had that concept of the, of the oneness and not the duality, we wouldn't, like, everything would work. Yeah, so that's a new age deception, deception too, right? The, the, the duality and stuff like that. People have to understand that we, if one suffers, we all suffer. We so, are all one. And yeah. Um, yeah, literally, because, the, you know, when Adam was 
created here, um, if you just follow DNA, it's expanded out to 7 billion, but it's still one organism. Like the cells actually move and, you know, attach to the, the female and, and then a new thing. Like it's still one being, literally. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's and I got you. And the allegory for sure. Not even allegory in real in real science. Like um, my kids are me. I am yeah. my father and my mother and my grandmother and all the way. Well, if you just extrapolate all the way back, guess what? You end up back at Adam. Mm. Right. Yeah. Adam, Eve came from Adam. So it's the same same being. You, hey, you better watch out who you say that to. No, just kidding. <laughs> Especially in Canada, you know, you got to watch your uh, pronouns, you know. <laughs> no. But, uh, it, <laughs> did it, you hear it, in the U.S. they just took out all the uh, gender terms out of the... Oh, yeah, they did hear oh, it. But I, don't, I, don't, I don't buy into that. There's yeah. gender. I mean, that's how it works. And, yeah. and it's, it's in the plant life. It's in all animal life. Like, yeah, what are you yeah. talking about? It's yeah. a law of nature. There's <laughs> masculine and feminine in, in everything. Yes. Yeah. So you might have answered this already, but in your opinion, who is the queen's oath with, or who is who is the contract? Who holds the contract? Um, it's between her and God. Yeah. Okay. Thinks you think so? That's what they. Uh, yeah. Read it. Yeah. That's what. Oh, that's what it says in the Bible. No, that's what, that's what, you can read her whole old thing. Like, oh, in her oath, I got you. Okay, for sure. So um, it, it's in front of other beings as well, because it's, it's in front of Lord's temporal, spiritual, and commons. That's in there. Um, the Watchers would have been part of that. And the, the, so we invoke the Watchers in the, uh, in, in the Notice of Liability. So they, they can, um, they're the first level past, you know, the, the boxes that I draw. That's whew, right there. And um, they're, they're on assignment here. There's seven of them, I think. And, um, and then there's a whole, you know, host of there, but they're the, they're the ones that are like, um, you know, you, you got to get past these guys or those, these beings, I don't, you know, I got to give them respect, but it's um, so that we've invoked that. So they're watching. Every, every move they make. So as we put these documents out, we're using their system and they have to honor it because if they don't, it's coming down like boom. Right. So they're on, a, they're on a thread right now. They're just trying to hold us back, but they really can't stop it. So do you think it was a process of humanity kind of turned away from God? Then we created false gods and we wanted someone else to 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 rule over us and then they're sort of like okay well then here these people are going to rule over you you guys chose this by your own free will so you're going to have a period of suffering because of that and there you know there's not going to be any um intervention necessarily um maybe until we raise ourselves up to a certain spiritual level or consciousness level well there's time limits on everything too like I said, there was 70 year, um, the Israelites were, were put into slavery for 70 years at, into Babylon, which is the same system we're talking about now. Mm. And I got a feeling they didn't tell anybody. And Daniel, because it says Daniel was shuffling through books or whatever. And he's like, hang on a second here. We should have been let go. Like, and um, boom. Within a day, they were like, out of here. Tacitly they, agreed. <laughs> yeah, because nobody brought forth the contract. Nobody brought forth the claim. It just They just kind of let you go, okay, yeah, you guys want to go along with this? It's, I'm good. Yeah. So we're at the stage now where people are, are fed up. You know, it's getting, it's getting crazy. So people are, you know, feeling unsettled and like, what, what is this reality? They're starting to come, you know, some, through some of the doors that I came through when I first got into court. It's like, what is this? You know, so we're at the stage now where people are looking for um, the solution or a solution. And 
you know, when we launch, it's it's going to be quite the thing to to watch. And there's other things going on on the on the planet as well. But um, this is going to be um, this is going to be a game changer because we are we're honoring every. There's the, the, you can find no fault, and not that anybody's perfect, but this is this is exactly you can't get a, around it. We, we're doing the proper procedure the proper way, and we're trying to get people into the right heart as well as much as we can. And um, there's nothing that can stop that, like nothing. It's it's one of those you turn the light on, and then you can't the darkness can't shut it off you know like it doesn't work that way so it's a it's a, it's it's you know in this sense it's that way and and there's nothing can happen like you, you can't stop it it's like trying to stop the tide or um like you just can't yeah it's almost like uh recognizing the matrix code and then unplugging yourself it's like recognizing the matrix code and then the do you and have to then play the matrix. Yeah, it's like okay, I see how this works, and pfft, the bullets fall down. You know, it's it's that. Yeah, yeah. John and I have a phrase. We call it uh, detachment activism. So detaching from the system completely and giving it no power. Yeah, it has no power. Which it, which is a is you know the true solution, and that's what you guys are teaching too. Is it's moral education educating people upon their power and how to pull away detach it's almost the opposite of that it's like you 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 displace them got it it's not like they are there and we have to get away from them it's more like they're you know like they're gone like we displace them it's like when the light comes on there's no more darkness, you know, other than shadows, but you can't, the darkness, the light isn't getting away from the darkness. The light is displacing the darkness and, and, it, and darkness can't displace light. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Like you can't make something, you can't get, turn darkness up so much that the light goes off. Yeah, I was saying this year, the one thing we've learned from 2020 is that there is no government, <laughs> you know, or like they really have no power. Like they come out and they make all these dictates and a lot of people, you know, like, my, you know, people in my family, they're like, they have to follow them and they're still following them. But for someone like me, who's aware that this is all nonsense, I'm just like, I'm going to go do my own thing. No one's going to stop me. They're not enforcing any of these laws. They don't actually, you know, the emperor doesn't wear any clothes, clothes. you know? <laughs> it's the, yeah, it's the Wizard of Oz. Go down the yellow brick road and go get the ruby slippers. Go down there and kill the, the witch of the blood. Go down. Like, and then when once the curtain went back, well, you didn't have to do any of that stuff. You actually had it all the whole time, you know? <laughs> so same, the same story. There's a, I think it was our third... Our third episode, we have a buddy, uh, Mike Mattingly. He's a musician and uh, he's really involved in the health freedom movement here. That's where I met him. He was the guy who, at the end of last year, there was basically like civil unrest at the Capitol because they passed the law. They broke all these rules to pass it, even though there were thousands of people there, opposition to it. They passed it anyway. And he started this in in the chamber he started singing his song that he had written about this whole movement and uh he got arrested whatever there was like seven women that got arrested with him he was the only one they brought charges against because he was very outspoken that's what he thinks so he him and a group of people in santa cruz do you know who david rodriguez is no yeah check him out look him up on facebook he's he's doing the same thing you went you went through He's basically challenging, you know, driving with no license plates. He's been arrested like 10 times, you know, um, and he's, you know, he's potentially got court cases against these law enforcement agents now. But um, anyway, um, Mike was going through all these different um, strategies and he sent me um, a link to, um, I'll send it to you too. It's a YouTube page called The Human Frequency. And we actually interviewed that woman too. And they bought, they uh, register their business names, like, right? But then they recommend this uh, man named Marcus, who's from Canada, the Servant King. Have you ever heard of him? 
you'll have to check him out too. So uh, he, he pulled his videos down. He had two series of videos. It was, um, one was called the confusion series and one was called um, unravel unraveled. And basically he had a bird um, sanctuary in Canada and Canada changed the laws. And then they started harassing him and telling him they were going to take his birds and they just made his life miserable and he learned that like you actually don't own any property right in this system and um he basically um i don't know I, I think you'd find it interesting um will actually pulled the videos down maybe we can um get them up and get them to you to watch um yeah. it's an interesting it's basically like what you're saying about the bible too i mean because he says the bible is the answer but what he's saying is that like it's he he really explains the process of how we we turn away from god which is the first commandment like only you know only worship god same mm -hmm. thing you said that jesus said right and then once we turn away from god then we try to rule ourselves but it doesn't work so we create a new ruler and we give our power over to this new ruler then we get reborn under that ruler and that's where the fictitious name comes in and um it's just it, it's it's really interesting it's a different little bit of a twist on um on your work um but very very compelling and interesting um you know i i found a lot of uh, value out of it so just thought i'd throw that out there he unfortunately it was funny i had i had watched all the the whole series and will watched it too and right after that they were gone hmm. and then he was restructuring his website and then he recently came out and so we figured he was monetizing it and you know we had no problem with that because you know he was putting out good information but when he finally relaunched uh it seems like possibly someone else is there speaking on his behalf now oh. and um it doesn't really look very um like he's necessarily in his right mind at this point but the description yeah. of wow. how man rejects god mm -hmm. and then creates his own god uh and that is babylon that's like the state you know and um it's just it's i think you'd find a lot of value in it too so yeah i mean that that, that is the situation you can get it all from the bible either allegory or 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 even direct direct knowledge from it it's um it's pretty amazing yeah um interesting yeah it, it's you know talking about cognitive bias that is my cognitive bias and i've not had to correct it yet and that that's astounding like it seems to work hmm. throughout almost well everything really and um you follow the principles in there and you and you get certain results in this matrix like it's just right they, yeah. they, like they can't get around it's like they that's you can't get around it and um so you so they've shot you know they've made everybody shun it so that you don't read it number one and then you know if you don't read it then you don't even know what's in there so um but as people are starting to discover that um you, you know, the more people that do and understand what's gone on here and, and, and how it works and, and this, and the structure and the, how the contract actually works and even the, how their system works, you, you know, this game is over. Like we can, it's, it's literally the, the, you know, the movie, the matrix is showing you that once you get to a certain level of understanding of how, what, what it is you're in, you know, like Morpheus said, you know, Neil's like, I'll be able to dodge bullets. No, you won't need to because mm -hmm. the bullets won't even exist. Yeah, it's like it's literally that fragile. This thing, it, it looks imposing, but it's like, and they know it. They know they're on their way out. Fascinating. Yeah. Love yeah. it. Will, you got any uh, any more questions, comments? I no, we, we covered a lot, man. And this is pretty much what our goal was with this episode was to kind of showcase your work and kind of whet the appetites of viewers and, and hopefully they uh they'll they'll check you out further, man. So thanks, Cal, for coming on. It, it was a pleasure. Yeah. It was my yeah. pleasure to be here. Yeah, and we can uh find you at empowermovement.com. Yep. 
empowermovement.com. Mm -hmm. I am a member and I can say there is a lot of good information on there and you guys are very fair with the way you've structured it and um, keeping us updated on what's going on. So I appreciate everything you've done. I did want to say, I think it's kind of cool that like, I think almost every single person we've interviewed is a musician too. <laughs> That's is that right. I, yeah, You're a pretty, drummer, right? Pretty I'm much. I'm a drummer, yeah. yeah on okay, some right. on some level. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, I've got drums all around me in here, and uh... awesome. I think that um, you know, um, Will works um, behind the scenes with What on Earth is Happening, which is uh, Mark Passio's website. And uh, Mark had said to him that like we're basically we're artists, you know, like we're teaching natural law, but we're we're doing it in different creative ways. And, you know, even what you created, I mean, it, it took a bit of artistry, I think, you know, yeah. that, that creative mind, you know, so I think that's a big part of what we're moving into, you know, it, it definitely is. It's there's a, there's an elegance to it and a, and a harmony and rhythm and all, you know, like all that stuff is there. It's yeah, it's, it's it's I'm I'm excited excited I'm excited to be alive at this time because um, there's not been a time in the in the history of creation that's what what it says in the Bible even the angels don't even know what's what's really happening here and um, it, it's uh, it, there's not been a time since day I think, one for sure I think one thing for sure just to kind of an idea is that like you know when we when we see the power structure here and the control structure here we realize it's wrong and then you take into account the law of correspondence as above so below that like you know maybe once we destroy this control system we are also going to be controlling you know destroying every other control system above that because i'm assuming in those spiritual realms there's the same type of structure there are different beings that maybe have you know, made claim over other beings and that maybe our process of breaking out of it is going to expand into the, the entire universe, you know? Again, again, in the Bible, there was a, there was a being called Lucifer. I will put myself above the most high. I will rise to the right size. Of, I'm paraphrasing, but he, he made a claim on the creator. Yeah. That's what this is all about. And yeah. this is all being played out right here right now that right. claim is being settled right and and the most high god took a big gamble in allowing you know adam and his descendants to be the 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 means of 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 adjudicating this awesome yeah it's 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 staggering once when we all see what what has happened and and who we are like really see it we're gonna go whoa yeah good time to wake up and get it get in the game folks yeah come on <laughs> get off the bench that's right <laughs> all right cal well we really appreciate you being here you definitely have added to uh to our work we feel like it's an evolution in thought and consciousness and you know just that everyone's different perspective is coming together and um so it's really beautiful we, we appreciate you being here no, oh, thanks, John. Thanks, and Cal. Yeah, thanks, Will. Yeah. Right on. All right, Will. Good show. Excellent. Right and on. Always, always remember, put something good in the air and plant something good in the earth. Peace. To you.